Hi, welcome to the Julie Rose Show. Today is Thursday, September 7th, 2017. I've got Eric on the line. Just wanted to turn the time over to you, Eric, and welcome you to the show. Thanks, Julie. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. We've had a lot of feedback from people on these podcasts, and we're just delighted that you are responding so well to them. It's humbling to us to hear that they're having a positive impact in your personal lives and in your relationships and your witness of things to come and your your witness and understanding of the plan of salvation in these latter days. And we're grateful for your, your positive and uplifting comments. In some of those comments, messages, and email, and, and so forth, we've had some questions come in from time to time. And there have been other doctrinal topics and so forth that we've just talked about doing, but didn't quite know how to fit them into a podcast. But with all this coming together, we think we can we can put an episode together on some, some various topics, especially related to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Julie's involvement in the church. And then a few other questions. And so and also in the spirit of lightening things up just a little bit, some of our podcast topics have been a little heavy recently. And so this uh, would be a good way to kind of lighten things up a little bit. So Julie, if you're okay with it, I have a, a series of questions for you. Is this going to work? Sure. You know how it is. So I'm just going to say this for the audience and you know how it is, Eric, we work together enough. Um, I, I'm this way on radio programs and, um, and on any podcast. So I'm, I'm good to have you ask any questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, I don't know. And if I'm not comfortable with the question for whatever reason, I'll just let you know that I don't feel like answering that. So feel free to ask anything you want. And, um, before we get started, I just want to let you know a few developments that are going on. Yesterday I had a conversation with Juan Gibby, who is, uh, the individual who's doing my documentary, he was at dinner with a gentleman who um, does one of the, uh, like three of the Coast to Coast programs, and we are planning to do a Coast to Coast radio radio show here pretty soon. I don't know when it'll be yet. We don't have a date for it, but I just want to let people know to stay tuned for that. I'll be on Coast to Coast coming up here in the next several weeks. That's pretty exciting. I understand Coast to Coast has a pretty wide listener base. Yeah, I think this particular individual has a viewership um, or or audience of about 3 million. So we'll be getting the message out to quite a few people. Lon, the plan right now is to have Lon on the radio show with me. We'll be talking about my story and the documentary and some of what's going into that. That's great. That's exciting. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, looking Some, forward to it. Yeah, something to look uh, forward to. Sure. Yeah. So, Julie, let me ask you a few questions. I want to start with uh, with your interactions in the, in the church. You are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I want to ask you about your, your attendance in church and temple activities. Mm-hmm. And that's, what would you like to know, Eric? Well, I mean, this may feel a little bit like a bishop's interview, and uh, you know, for all intents, for for other people, this might be considered kind of personal. But um, I th- I think this is just an I'm opportunity fine. for you to just to answer a lot of these questions so they stop popping up, you know. Right. So basically, yeah. the right. question is: I keep getting these e- emails from people because there's all these rumors going around about about my church membership and activity, and and right. there's just a lot and. And I can't dispel all the rumors. That's not the goal of this. But um, if we can put some of it at bay, I think that's good. I, I, I don't. I just don't have time to respond to all the emails that are coming in, and right. I don't want to let. I don't want people to think I'm ignoring them. So I think um, we might as well just go ahead and, and address it. Um, I am an active member of the LDS Church now. According to LDS um, records, to be considered active, you only have to go to church once a month to sacrament meeting, which is the main meeting. Um, I am much more active than that. I actually go every week unless I have health issues. Um, And so if there's someone in my home ward that doesn't see me, I'm either traveling and attending another ward when I, when I go to a different location or um, I'm homesick with, with some of the health issues that I deal with. So I try to go to my meetings every week. Um, I'm assigned visiting, a visiting teaching route. I go to the temple as often as possible. I used to go about once a week, sometimes twice a week, with all my travels, and now being about an hour and a half away from the temple, um, 
I'm, I'm lucky to be able to go about once a month, although it's been more frequent than that, um, depending on what's going on with my kids' sports schedules and stuff like that. It's kind of hard because I have to be able to leave early enough in the morning to go do a session like maybe 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock session in order to get back to pick my kids up from school at 3.15. So that's, that's my biggest thing is just being a little bit further from the temple right now. But um, I, so, I'd say I go to the temple at least once a month. Well, that sounds and a lot. Sometimes, about sometimes like twice a month. Another million members or two that I can think of. <laughs> yeah. If I had my way, I'd probably go there every day because I love going to the temple. A lot of the time, so that's about how often I can go do a session. Sometimes I can go more frequently than that because I can go do initiatories or endow, um, not endowment ceiling. And I can get in and out in a half hour to 45 minutes instead of needing to block out three hours. So, um, in fact, well, not that I need to share this with people, but I, maybe I shouldn't announce I'm going to the temple on a date night with my husband coming up here pretty soon. We have a date night scheduled on September 15th, and we're going to go go to the Kansas City Temple and then clean the temple afterwards. So I also help clean the temple for those that are familiar with that. I, I enjoy doing that. There's a different kind of experience you have when you clean the temple. Yeah. So do you and your family members have uh, callings in the church? Um, yes, actually. So my husband was recently called... He was teaching youth Sunday school. A couple months ago, he got called as a counselor in the bishopric in our ward. And I have been a teacher in Relief Society, um, I don't know, for how many months. Since last fall, they called me as a teacher in Relief Society. So that's what I do right now. Is it, what is it like being someone, you know, I guess someone in the public spotlight as a member of the church? Does it create trouble for you at all? It has. Um, but not anything I, I can't handle, you know, depending on what ward I've been in. I started, I, I wrote the, the first two books in Arizona in 2014, and we just lived there for 15 months. Prior to that, we lived in Overland Park, Kansas for 11 years, or just under 11 years. Then we moved to Arizona in 2000, 2013, and in 2014, when I wrote those first two books, we only lived there a year and a half. So members of the ward didn't know me at all when I moved in. None of them, most of them had no idea I was writing books. I was very low key about it. And um, I had a handful of friends that knew that I was doing that. And then by the time the second book came out, we moved because my husband got a job in Iowa. So then we lived in Iowa for 22 months. He actually stayed um, working in Iowa. The spirit told us to move to Kansas last summer. So we moved the 1st of July of 2016 to uh, Kansas, and we moved an hour south of where we used to live. So we're in a different stake, but we're in sister stakes, and members of our stake used to be part of the same stake years ago that when my husband grew up. So we know a lot of people in the stake, although um, I've been really low-key out here. One of the reasons we bought, we, we bought property, we bought 20 acres on a house out just south of um, Ottawa, Kansas, and we did that for um, several reasons. According to my husband, he, d he doesn't quite know why we did it other than the spirit told him to do it. My understanding is I saw this house and property and vision, and it's going to be a way station for people coming through from the east as some of the tribulations start. So we'll be here as a way station for a time before we go west. And, um, and it's nice to live out in the country. Uh, energetically, for me, it's very therapeutic. It's very calming. I work from home with, with the relief organization and then doing energy sessions. So it's nice to be able to, like today, I sat out on my front porch and just made phone calls and, and did three sessions with clients. And so it's very relaxing out here. It takes about 15 minutes to get into town. We have a town of 10,000 people, and it's about 45 minutes north for us to get up to Olathe, where we have metropolitan Kansas City. So, so um, Julie, yeah. speaking of property, um, do you... Do you or your husband or GTRF have any other properties? Um, we do not personally own any houses, my husband and I. Um, GTRF actually does not own any properties. The way that we're structuring it is individuals reach out to me and ask if they can provide a safe house, and they're privately owned by the individuals, and then we work with them to develop the safe house properties to get them um, ready for for people coming through and to work as kind of refugee lo locations. So GTRF does not own properties, uh, at least not right now, and I don't know if we will. And I, I only own the house that I live in. Um, we have owned, uh, in all of our marriage, five properties, five houses. 
and two of those were rentals when we lived in our house in Overland Park, and then we had our first house when my husband first got out of law school when we were in Wichita, Kansas. So um, they've always been private residences, and our current house is a private residence. We purchased it um, off of my husband's income, so any of the income I've made from the books or any income that's come in for GTRS, um, none of that's come to me personally for this property. Um, everything we're doing so far on this property has come out of my husband's income, and that's how we qualified for the house and everything. I know there's some rumors going around out there what, wondering what I'm doing with the money that I've made. So yeah. I put all of my book money, with the exception of a few thousand dollars, and um, and paying off the credit card that we had from moving from Arizona to Iowa. We, we got some credit card debt. Um, I paid that credit card off with some of my book royalties, and then the rest of it I've used for travel to go around and speak and to buy books to give away for free or to um, basically get the message out. I've just put it all back in. And same with the DTRF funds. Anything that's come in, we've used that for supplies or for um, travel to be able to connect for funding and other things. So, um, and I keep all of the business expenses separate from personal finances so that, you know, on my taxes and stuff, it's clean. Gotcha. Okay. I want to steer us back to the, the topic of the church and some more things there. Do you, um, let me, this is kind of a basic one. Do you sustain the first presidency of the church and the quorum of the 12 apostles? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Um, I am so, so grateful for what they do. They have amazing, amazing abilities and gifts, and they have an incredible stewardship. Um, I can't imagine the pressure they must feel as prophets and apostles and disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ to represent and his, as his servants on earth to represent the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm grateful for the work that they do. I have absolutely no doubt that they've been called of God and that they are servants of God as true messengers. And I'm... I'm forever grateful for the living prophets we have now and for those that have lived on the earth before. It's interesting. I hear these people that say things like Joseph Smith was a true prophet. And I always want to say, what do you mean was he is? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I see him on the other side of the veil. Right. And he's still working and same with Moses and Elijah, Noah, like they're all still working on the other side of the veil as prophets and, and um, in the capacity as, you know, leading legions of spirits over there. So, Anyway, and I and I see the same thing pretty soon with President Monson when it's time for him to pass through the other side of the veil. He'll go on, and he'll complete the rest of his of his ministry on the other side of the veil as he leads and guides and directs those and teaches those on the other side of the veil once he passes. That's nice. Thank you for that witness. I want to ask you yeah. another question um, with regard to some of your gifts. Now, we've I've demonstrated scripturally and doctrinally that. Uh, in, on previous podcasts, that all of God's children are are able to receive the gift of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy. You are obviously a very gifted person in that area of being able to see things past, present, and future. And this gets sticky for some people who think that you're with you're outside of your bounds of um, seeing and right. saying what's what's going to happen in the future and stuff. So I want to ask you if you claim to receive inspiration, revelation, or direction on behalf of other people? Uh, no, not at all. I never have. That's a consistent message that I will continue to give. I do I do see things about people, and um, I am told things about people as it pertains to my mission and my stewardship with what I understand I've been called to do. But I have never... Um, share that with people. I don't, I don't tell people that even when I see it, but the Lord has told me is Julie, just cause you see it doesn't mean you say it. So, um, for instance, if I see something that pertains to one of my siblings, I, I don't share it because I don't want to take their agency away. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason the Lord shows it to me is so that I can understand it or I can be empathetic or I can help support them in the way that I need to support them. Um, the same goes for anybody else that's in my life. And most of what I see pertaining to other people, if I can discern things that they're struggling with or health issues or other things when I can see into their energy or whatever, um, there are specific guidelines the Lord has on both sides of the veil with uh, respecting people's agency. And that's where stewardship comes in, in part. And um, I'm continually being taught by the Spirit that, that um, 
we can receive revelation as it pertains to ourselves and those in our stewardship, like our children, and those if we have a church calling or something like that. Um, I have um, been given certain insight, if you will, because of my eternal mission that has been made known to me that I was set apart for on the other side of the veil that um, later on, I'm confident, you know, say we fast forward in 10 years, then it'll be very clear to people at that point or most people why I was given the gifts that I have and why I can see what I can or what I claim to see. And they'll understand that there was a bigger mission involved here than what most people recognize right now. And so that's why I can boldly claim what I do and I can stand up for what I I say I see because I'm not afraid for people um, to understand and for it's important for them to understand the difference between different types of stewardship. I don't hold any keys. I don't hold any priesthood authority and I don't claim so. And um, there's a far, a far, a far difference between somebody who has keys and authority uh, and priesthood, priesthood keys and authority or stewardship over church calling versus being called by the Spirit as a covenant people to stand for Christ and to stand up as a witness for Him. And then even later on, I know that I will be given certain callings or keys to um, important aspects of the gospel that come, come later. And I don't mean, I'm not talking priesthood authority with in, in the way that we're looking at right now. I don't want people to be confused. But I've seen that I will be set apart for a calling later on, and that's what I mean by, by that. And um, that doesn't happen until, you know, well into the future after things have kind of deteriorated and we're in the tribulations. And so um, how that comes about, I'm not going to go into, but, but I do know that, that is the case. And, and it comes in a manner that, that once that happens and it, it's, it's understood by people, then, you know, I have no doubt that people, most people will be comfortable with why I've shared what I have. And, <clears throat> and and understanding that there's a big difference between um, having personal revelation and having like revelation for the church or for a body of people, and I've never claimed that, and I still don't claim that. Um, I see things in the world and on the other side of the veil, and in my own life, and in the United States, because it specifically pertains to my mission. And they continue on the other side of the veil to tell me that the reason I need to see this is because it pertains to my mission specifically and to my life, to my personal life. And with that, they let me know what I need to know, when I need to know it, how I need to know it, so that I can advance in my understandings and my knowledge so that I can be who I need to be whenever I'm supposed to be that. And I'm still trying to figure that out. I ask every day, multiple times a day why are you showing this to me or why am I hearing this or what am I supposed to do with this? And it's something we need to all ask ourselves when we're given any kind of revelation. So, so it and sounds making like... sure that the revelation is coming from the right source, right? Because Satan can give us all kinds of false stuff. Right. It sounds like you receive yeah. revelation that, that may be pertinent to other people, but you don't think right. it's, you, it's not your role to tell them what to do with that. Or you, you basically respect people's agency and you don't, tell people what to do based on your revelations. I'm, I am passionate about, about agency. That's what this premortal war was about. That's what the war is still about is agency. It's one of the many things that we fought for and that we're still fighting for on, on both sides of the veil. It absolutely um, is critical to the plan that we have agency. And uh, I would never assume or want to take anyone's agency away. That is contrary to my nature. Mm -hmm. It's contrary to the Lord's plan. I want only to support his plan, which is first and foremost to know that there's, there's agency and that we have an eternal atonement that's been, been offered to us. And, and so I, I'm constantly weighing what I know with what I'm allowed to say, because in giving, in giving the knowledge and sharing the knowledge that I have, if somebody listens to a podcast or, hears me speak somewhere else or meets me and we have a discussion or, or they read the books or however they come across whatever knowledge I might share with them. They are then accountable once they hear that knowledge and once they, once their spirit resonates with that. And once, once the Lord knows and only the Lord knows what they know and what they understand, then they become accountable. And so it's not something to take, taken lightly because if someone's not ready to hear something and they reject it, 
then it's to their condemnation, not to their salvation exaltation. And so only the Lord knows when someone has actually heard a message or when it's actually resonated with their spirit to the point that they have an understanding and knowledge to act, which is why we can't judge either, right? I mean, I, I have an, some things about probation that I've lived and um, like premortal memories that I have and things pertaining to my premortal experiences as well as my life here on earth that some people just don't have for various reasons. And I'd say the majority of the people don't have. And for whatever reason, because I need it to progress in this, this probation, it's been given to me. So um, just like I would hope people wouldn't judge me for claiming that I know that, I don't judge them for not knowing it. If, if it's not part of their plan and they're not time for them to know it, the Lord's not going to give it to them. So I, I'm 100% comfortable with people... Um, either accepting or rejecting this message if they're not ready to accept whatever truth, because I believe that God has a perfect plan for every individual, and we only advance in that knowledge and that light as we're ready for it, as we accept it for, for ourselves with agency. If I were to try to force anything on anyone, it's contrary to God's plan, it's contrary to agency, and I'd be working for the devil, and that's not who I work for. Great, great. Well said, Julie. I'm a witness that everything you said is true about your nature. I've known you long enough and well enough now to know that you respect agency. Do you claim the authority to proclaim doctrines, new doctrines, unusual doctrines, on behalf of the Church? Well, I, I appreciate that question. I know you asked it earlier. I don't claim any authority. I have, I have no authority, and not only do I not claim authority, I don't have new doctrines to present. There has been nothing I've said that could be construed or misconstrued, even though people are doing it, to say that I have publicly ever said to somebody that there's a certain doctrine. Now, there might be a new way that people have never thought of that doctrine because their eyes are opening because of the verbiage that I use, but I myself have, have never proclaimed doctrine, nor do I, nor do I plan to be the one to tell people what certain doctrines are. I don't think it's my role. I don't find that as part of my mission. I might be there to one day testify and warn of certain things that come forth later through proper keys and authority of the Church, but I myself do not have the role, as far as I understand, at least nobody's telling me this, that um, will be the person that's going to announce any of that stuff. And, and if there are people on the planet right now, and there are some, and I won't name names, but there are some that are claiming authority, that are dissenting from the Church, and that are claiming that they have um, certain authorities to be able to change or transition people away, those individuals are leading to apostasy right now, and they take part in the great apostasy I see coming. Interesting. Speaking of that, the apostasy and, and that kind of thing, are there any doctrines in the Church that you are unsatisfied with, or you think that are incorrect, that you think should be changed or altered? No, that's never even crossed my mind. I see a lot of cultural things that really get on my nerves. Quite honestly, there are a lot of things, and I see it exponentially growing in the Church with false belief systems and cultural things that absolutely irritate me. But from a doctrinal standpoint, there's not a single doctrine I take, I take issue with. In fact, if anything, I want to witness and testify of the importance of the doctrines because they go hand-in-hand hand with the ordinances, which are necessary for us to take part in to advance in our powers, priests, and understandings. And so if there's someone that takes issue with the doctrines, my word of caution to them is uh, what has been told us by, by our living prophets and apostles, which is doubt your doubts before you doubt, doubt, you know what I mean? Doubt your doubts first, which is basically, I, I have a sure knowledge of these doctrines. Not only do I not doubt them, I have a sure knowledge of them and the importance they play in our lives. Now, there are cultural things that have become like doctrine to some people, but that doesn't mean they're doctrines. There are cultural things that have infiltrated the Church and Christendom in general that are false beliefs and false traditions that have been passed down that I believe need to be broken before we can progress into the Church, the firstborn. But it's not my place to, to go around and try to correct everybody's behavior. I myself have actively worked at trying to get rid of my own false beliefs, and you can do that through praying to the Lord and asking Him to show you what your false traditions are as as is witnessed in the scriptures as types and shadows that we know upon the heads of the third and fourth generation is the condemnation to the, to the traditions of their fathers. 
those traditions can be good and they can be bad. And we have a lot of traditions now going four generations or more into the church that have been passed down that need to be broken. Okay. In all this, you know, the last three years of your message being more public, have you ever been approached by church leaders for like a disciplinary action of any kind? No, no. I've had conversations with every, every bishop and state president because I've gone to them and I've given them my books and I've told them about the work that I'm involved in. Um, I, I had a state president in Arizona that um, didn't know anything about me and he got a call from one of the members or of the 70s that was concerned when I was going around speaking. He was concerned that I was selling books in the Mesa Interstate Building. Other than that, uh, they didn't want the church didn't want to lose their tax exempt. They can get in, and and so um, even though the individual who scheduled us at the Interstate Building, which is a public building, they use it for book signings and all that kind of stuff all the time. Um, their only concern was they didn't want me selling books on on that church owned property from a ta- tax exempt, and so they that's the only time I'd been called in to the president's office for that. I had um, a couple interviews with my state president in Iowa. I first went to him and gave him my book. And, of course, he was trying to make sense of, like many members of the church, how can she be getting this revelation and doing these things, but she doesn't have, quote-unquote, authority? And then we had some conversations so I could explain to him what I was involved in because I was brand new to Iowa, and all he heard was, you know, the rumors, um, the rumors and stuff that was going down. Once he met me and, and we talked, he was, he was nothing but gracious. I have never even come close to having any kind of church disciplinary. In fact, I've got, I've got three of my previous bishops that are members of GTRF now. If that isn't witness that, I mean, you know, <laughs> anyway, I, it, it's amazing to me the, the things that people say, but I, I can understand the concern people have because they've got these ideas in their mind, which again go with tradition, and they've never come across somebody like me as a member of the church. And so it gets them out of their comfort zone. They don't know how to put it in the box of where I fit in. You know, how does, how does she fit in with what we understand with the traditions of their fathers? And the, and so. the easy assumption is that she's doing something a little different. Therefore she's apostatizing and she's going to lose right. her membership status before too long. Right. Well, and when my books came out, they came out a year after the whole Kate Kelly incident where, um, ordained women was being really, really aggressive with, you know, trying to protest about women getting the priest and stuff like that. So I had people, she had just been excommunicated, same with Denver Snuffer and some other people. And so there was, there's was there been heightened sensitivity to people like that who, um, by all appearances, start out looking like, like lambs, and in the end, they're, you know, attacking the sheep and, um, and are not who they pretend to be. Or in some cases, I, I look at somebody like Kate Kelly, and my heart goes out to her because I think, I think originally it was probably well intentioned, and she just is listening to the wrong voices, and and um, and so I was compared to Kate Kelly by by several people, and there are still people comparing me to her. I I don't want to speak ill of her or anyone else. I I just think we're all on our own journey, our own path. I don't agree with anything she does. Um, I I am uh, probably her polar opposite when it comes to some of the views that she has, or somebody who actually know my heart. Um, but I do know that we will see a day when, when things in the church are going to shift and, um, and we're going to go from having, having the way things are structured now to being far different when the Lord, when the Lord takes, um, takes the reins. And that's because we will transition into a higher, a higher vibration and a higher way of living things. And so we won't need some of the programs and stuff that we have in the church. Thank you for that. I'm At least also, not to the same degree. You know, we got a lot of programs right now because it's what people need on a celestial level. Yeah, that's that's right. I'm a witness to that doctrine, by the way. Um, another question or two uh, concerning the church. Have you, in the last three years, or four years, five years, had any correspondence with members of, say, the Quorum of the Twelve, Seventy, or even the First Presidency? Yeah, well, I'm glad I can finally speak about this. I finally have permission from the Spirit to say something about that because I've had dozens and dozens of people email me and ask, and people come up to me when I've spoken in public and, and ask me 
does the prophet know what you're doing, all that. My understanding from the Spirit is that um, they actually have, and I've only gotten this from Spirit, nobody's ever told me this, they actually have someone assigned to, to monitor my website and to monitor the work that I'm doing. Um, I see that in vision. They, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but they've even shown me who it is that's doing that. And they keep an eye on me just to make sure that I'm, you know, not saying anything inappropriate that's going to make them uncomfortable. Um, I don't have proof of that. It's only what I've been shown by the Spirit. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. I'm not claiming, I'm not claiming any factual information there. I'm just telling you what I understand for the Spirit. The only conversations I've had have been through email, um, an email that I initiated in January of 16. What, um, it was actually end of December of 16, first part of January 16. I was shown in vision for about three months. Um, a lot of people were calling church headquarters starting in 2014 when my books came out. A lot of concerns about who this Julie Rowe was, and I came out of nowhere, right? And so all of a sudden, this lady shows up, and she's claiming revelation, and da 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 da, da and they had concerns. So they called Elder Ballard's office, Elder Iron's office, and Elder Oaks, and some of the others. I, for whatever reason, I don't know why, if maybe Elder Ballard's over certain things, the Spirit told me that a lot of people were calling Elder Ballard more than, than some of the other apostles. I don't know if that's true, again, because I'm only going on what the Spirit told me, but um, that's what I understood. So at one point, I was instructed by the Spirit to call and just have a brief conversation with Elder Ballard's secretary. Again, I initiated that, and it was just a friendly call to say hi and thank you, and I'm really sorry. I'm Mrs. Julie Rowe. I'm really sorry for all the people harassing you. And that was, um, that was, that was that, that was it. And that was the purpose for my call. And it, and it didn't go anywhere and it wasn't supposed to. And then I, I call another occasion directed by the spirit to call Elder Irene's office and talk to his secretary and to let her know that I wanted to get a message to Elder Irene that, um, I had started the relief effort, my, my nonprofit organization to let him know about my third book coming out because I knew at that point that they knew about a greater tomorrow and time is now. And we had gone, um, we had just had the lunar eclipse a few months before and all that negative press. And um, I just wanted the church to know that, like, that I was doing the relief program, or I mean, the um, relief organization that I had set up. And I didn't want them to hear about it from somebody else. I wanted them to hear about it from me and just give them a heads up when media stuff happened again. I saw in vision in 2014 that once this earthquake happens, there's going to be a, a media circus surrounding my name again. And because I didn't know exactly when that would be, and I didn't know when the earthquake would be or when, when some of this documentary and other things came, I just didn't want the church to be cut off guard. It's a real nightmare for the church on the PR side to have kind of loose cannons out there, and I wanted to minimize that for the church because I have great respect for the brethren and for everything they're doing. So I was prompted by the Spirit to call Elder Iron's office, his secretary, um, said she suggested to me that I send Elder Iring an email. So that's what I did. I constructed an email and sent it to Elder Iring, and I did that. It was either the end of December or first first couple days in January. And within two weeks of sending that email, I got a reply letter in the mail. I found it interesting. I was instructed by the Spirit to sign to sign my name as Julie Rowe on the email, and to um, put my, I didn't put my membership number or any of that, right? I didn't put my mailing address, which at the time was a P.O. box because I was living in Iowa. I was unlisted in Iowa except for church leadership. No one in Iowa could see where I lived because of death threats and other things. The Spirit instructed me when we moved to Iowa to just put my mailing address um, for leadership to see and no members to see so nobody could look me up. And so I knew that the only way that they could mail a letter to me was if they knew exactly who I was or they looked it up and they got my membership record and mailed it to my P.O. box. And I did that purposely because I was shown in vision that I was going to get a letter back. I was told what the letter would say roughly and about how long it was. And I saw that in vision a week before it came in the mail. And that's exactly what happened. I got a letter from the secretary to the first presidency. And in behalf of the first presidency, he sent a letter to me, thanked me for my letter. Now my letter to them or my email to president Irene, I did not write it to the first presidency. I wrote it to president Irene and my letter to him basically just said, I just wanted to thank you for your service and all that you do. I wanted to let you know that I've written 
three books that um, that my third book is going to be coming out in a couple of months. And I gave him the title of that, From Tragedy to Destiny. And then I let him know that I had incorporated a nonprofit organization in October of 2015, which was a couple months prior, and and that um, I anticipated I would have some media related to that, and I just wanted to let them know about that. And um, the reply I got back was, again, from the Secretary of the First Presidency, in behalf of the First Presidency, thanking me for the kind email and letting me know that they do not comment on the writings of others, and they wish me well in my endeavors. And that was the basic gist of the letter. And I've had no communication since. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. One one final topic with regard to the church. Um, actually, let me ask this question last of all, and then I'll move on. In in because of your gifts and so forth, do you claim to or do you call yourself a prophetess or a seer, or do you claim this title for yourself? I don't call myself anything, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> there are probably plenty Jules, of other people doing J-U-L-E-S, that for you. <laughs> J-U-L-E-S, J-U-L-Z, or Julie. A couple of my friends call me Queen every now and then. <laughs> and I get very uncomfortable with that. <laughs> Um, I don't call myself anything and I don't claim any of that. I have other people that have tried to give me titles like, you know, trying to say I'm a seer and stuff, but, um, I have spiritual gifts the Lord's given me and I have no titles and I don't really want titles. I don't really like titles. Okay. Fair enough. Now I want to shift gears still in relation to the church, but I want to move into the future. Um, for those who have read the book, Visions of Glory, Spencer in there talks about a large earthquake taking place in Salt Lake. And then shortly following, there was a meeting in the conference center in Salt Lake, I believe. And it might have been mm-hmm. the tabernacle. And and it was a solemn occasion. And there were a number of coffins at the front of the building. And those coffins held the bodies of members of church leadership. Um, now, this is a okay. kind of a sensitive issue. I just wanted to see, though, if you had anything, if you have similar insights to what Spencer shared in his book there. Well, I haven't actually read that. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me if I've read Spencer's book and if I've met him. I have met him, um, and I've had conversations with him. I um, I was given his book by two different people that were close friends of mine that were the only two people at the time that knew of my story and both of them did neither one of them knew each other. And they both bought me the book. I read, um, the first third of the book and it resonated very, very much with my story. It was almost verbatim what I'd been shown. And then the spirit said, okay, don't read anymore. And so I put the book down and then two months later, my second friend gave me the book and the spirit said, okay, go ahead and start reading again. So I did a quick read through, but honestly it was like a skim read because at that point I was, um, writing my own books and I was traveling so much and doing things. And the spirit basically said, uh, no, that was in 13. So it was right when I was having the visions about my books coming. And the spirit basically said, um, okay, it's important for you to know who this person is and um, that his books are kind of preparing the way for your books. And he has his mission, but don't really read it because you need to keep your story, your story and, and not get it convoluted with his. So I don't remember that part of what you're talking about. I, um, so I'm sorry, I don't really know, but I, I can only say what I know, which is that I have seen that about half a dozen of the Corner 12 will pass to the other side in the next several years. Do you, would you go as far as to link that event to s- some sort of future event following thereafter, like say the Church of the Firstborn? Um, I see most of, I, I see most of those, those individuals passing before Church of the Firstborn comes. So, um, like I see six of those brethren passing through their side of the veil due to old age mostly. And then other apostles will be called. Uh, some younger apostles will be called um, to fill their shoes the best they can. Nobody fills the shoes, but you know what I mean, to take that office. Mm. Um, I do see um, some similar things taking place in church leadership to what Joseph Smith went through with Oliver Cowdery and Sidney Rigdon. Um and I see a little bit of that going on. But for the most part, those apostles that we lose, uh, we lose them because they pass through the other side of the veil due to old age. Um, if 
if they go from another way, I haven't been shown that. So I don't have, I just know that I, I've been told and I see that, that at least six of them, uh, go to the other side. That's interesting. I've always been interested in a quote by Joseph Smith, you know, who said, in effect, if you stay with a majority of the quorum of the 12 apostles, you'll you'll be on the right side. So the, I just wonder right. in that event if Joseph had any insight of that event and he was giving us some timely advice, you know. For the, right, you know. types and shadows for our day as well. We know that in the scriptures. And I was taught the importance of working in councils a long time ago and the importance of working and, and staying with the majority of the brethren as well. There's a reason that those brethren work in councils as a majority. And I'm not going to go into the personal details of what happened to me when I was in college with some of my family things, but I learned in college the importance of um, how they work together as a unified council, and there's there's power in that unification. So you've mentioned councils now, um, and just, just going back to some of our personal conversations, is there anything you can say about the structure of your relief organization moving forward? Right. Um, well, first of all, I want to talk about the Church of the Firstborn because we're transitioning a little back, uh, back to that because you asked me a question. Oh, yeah. I see in the Church of the Firstborn it being set up in councils similar to the patterns in the heavens. And those that are familiar with the patterns of the heavens, you have a council, you have a presidency of three, you have your 12, which, and then that presidency with the 12 makes it 15, and then it expands out to 24 on the council, goes to 48, then 72, and on out to 144. And and that, that councils of men and women with separate councils working together in uni, unified form. So um, that's what I see with the Church of the Firstborn. And um, with, with um, my relief organization, I've been instructed. I have a board of directors, and the board of directors is part of the councils that I have. Um, I have been instructed to pattern it after the way it's patterned in the heavens and that working through councils. So I don't make any decisions on my own. Um, I don't take that authority upon myself, whether we're talking about spending money on certain things or where we, where we decide to agree to have uh, certain safe houses or any other endeavor that we have. I, I guess you could say I, as the president of the company, I have final, final approval, um, but I seek my counsels. I have, um, I have a first and second counselor essentially that work in a presidency with me, and then I have, I have a women's council and I have a men's council and they work together over certain aspects of areas um, and areas of specialty that we have. And there is real power in those councils because all of those individuals bring their gifts to the plate and to their table. And then I can, it takes a lot of pressure off me, but also I'm just one person. I can't, I can't come up with all the inspiration that we need and um, I'm not supposed to. So it's really nice to have those council members, um, Right now, I have established um, a, a council of 24, the 24 men, and then um, I've got about half a dozen of the of the initial 12 put together, and in the next month or so, I should have the rest of the women's council that's over what we call our ACE team. Our ACE team is our number one team, and they oversee things like hygiene kits, education, healing, um, kind of more of the traditional, what the LDS Church knows about, like Relief Society type stuff. And the A, the A team, which is over the men, are area specialists, and they help us with what we're going to do with the rescue mission, especially on human trafficking side, and being able to prepare things, you know, things that we need for that, like, um, like overseeing uh, any kind of transportation needs and stuff like that that we have for rescuing. I don't know if that answered it, but you got a really long answer for whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. You're at, you covered everything. So. I feel like we've had a pretty good array of questions. I think this should answer a lot of people's questions on this topic, and I hope it's been uplifting and beneficial to you listening. It has been to me. I'll just uh, just close with my testimony that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is God's kingdom upon the earth. I know that it's led by inspired men and women. Um, I know that we have the priesthood and saving ordinances, and um, the fullness of the doctrines that pertain to our salvation and i'm grateful for those and so i'm grateful for my membership in the church thank you eric i appreciate your your testimony of that i too want to add my testimony to leave no doubt in the ears of my listeners wherever you may be 
that I know that Joseph Smith is a true prophet, as is every prophet that has lived on this earth, as representatives of the Lord's gospel, and that we have a living prophet, Thomas S. Monson, who is the leader of this church in, in modern times, and that we will soon have another living prophet as, as the time comes for President Monson to pass the other side of the veil, that we will have our living prophet then come that has been called upon and foreordained by the Lord. I know this to be true. I have a testimony and a witness that I give to you that the Lord works through small and simple means, and that through these, these men and those that work with him in the councils in heaven as well as on the earth, the Lord brings to, back, brings to pass his righteous purposes. I testify and witness to you that that we have an organization that is on the earth right now that is exactly what it's supposed to be and exactly where it's supposed to be doing what it's supposed to be doing, that the Lord loves his children, he is directing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he's directing many of his children all over this planet, preparing them for the next level of their growth, insight, knowledge, and understanding. I have no doubt of this. I know that the keys and ordinances of the gospel have been restored as, as we have them thus far, and that the Lord is orchestrating exactly according to the plan he had foreordained before we ever came to this earth and before it was ever designed. I leave this witness and testimony with you, knowing that as we do all we can to stick to the basis of the Church and to the ordinances of the Gospel as we fulfill our divine rights and our obligations and our duties that we covenant to do, we can be able to progress eternally into the heavens as was designed and orchestrated and is being uh, put forth by a loving Father in Heaven who wants us to come home. As we do this, we can gather home on both sides of the veil. We can bring the family home to help, safety, and, and find rest in his soul. And I leave this testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.